So the next type of transit we'll be looking at is current chopping, but before we get into that uh, formulation, let's just kind of review what we've looked at so far. So as far as transits, we've looked at three different types. We've looked at an RL fault transit. There's not an overvoltage associated with this. It's more of an overcurrent. Um, basically, there's going to be a difference between the instantaneous asymmetrical current that you have in the first few cycles after the fault occurs and the symmetrical fault current that you would calculate if you were going to neglect the X to R ratio. And so that's going to be dependent on the relative ratio between the omega L and the resistance in the circuit. The higher that value is, the more of a DC offset you could have. It's something we would see during just the first cycle or two. Uh, this is where we would be concerned about whether the circuit breaker would have the correct um, instantaneous rating or not. There's two different types of shunt capacitor switching we looked at. Uh, one was for power factor corruption capacitors. And what we saw in that case is that the over voltage could actually jump up to three times the source voltage. Now the reason for this is that we could have a trap charge on the capacitor, say it could be at negative the peak value of the source, and then when the source were going to switch on at its full positive value, then that's where we have the most initial voltage across the switch, and that's where we get these large values of of voltage. So that won't happen all the time. It depends on the circumstance in the field, but three times the source voltage would be the worst case. Um, so anyway, as far as the overcurrents that you would have associated with this, you would have some transit overcurrents associated with this as well. Uh, if you look at the formulation, I mean, basically that's going to be related to two times the source voltage divided by the characteristic impedance, which is the ratio of L to C. Um, as far as the dependencies, a lot of this is going to depend on what is the size of the capacitor we're switching in, say the size of the power factor correction capacitor, and how it relates to the, the source impedance at equivalent system inductance. But the, the, the frequencies associated with this are relatively on the low side if you look at all the different transits that can occur. Uh, maybe as low as 300 hertz up into maybe the kilohertz region. And so what we would be concerned about in this case is what kind of power factor, um, what kind of power quality implica uh, implications this would have for our load that's in parallel with this because maybe some of this load would be sensitive to these over voltages. So if we had cable in parallel, then this cable is going to get stressed a little bit more. And then we talked about another type of transit that involves capacitance that's referred to as a transit recovery voltage. In this case, we saw that the source volt, the, the, the over voltage could be two times the source voltage. But since this ringing frequency is so high, we have a high value of dVdt. And so what that can do is that could put stress across the, the insulation. So the dependency in this case is this is dependent on the stray bus capacitance that we would have in the source side of the circuit breaker. And so we would have to look at the bus bars and what type of bushings we had and um, whether we had measurement transformers connected up and how that's going to uh, relate to the source impedance. And the, the transit frequencies that we have in that case would be up in, say, the tens of kilohertz. And so the, the sort of damage associated with this would be, well, the first thing we worry about is the stress on the circuit breaker. Would it be possible that when that circuit breaker operates to clear the fault, that that transit stress could be high enough that we would um, possibly have like a restrike and a reignition? So anyway, that's the three different sort of transits we've, we've covered to date. So next thing we'll look at is, is what happens when you have a current chop. And we talked about this, or we, we saw this a little bit in the second homework. We had a current chop associated with the transit recovery voltage. Um, so you've kind of seen this and what, what the impact could be. But basically, if we're going to be interrupting an inductive current, um, this is going to lead to the possibility of having a current chop and having some over voltages associated with that. 
And especially where we see that now is since we have so many circuit breakers out there that are based on vacuum interrupter technology, where we have these vacuum bottles and these contacts break open, and the fact that those are going to be uh, more susceptible to having this current chop because they can operate, they can operate open at such high speeds. So what happens in this case is when you um, basically have a couple of these um, metal conductors separating, um, since you could have a pretty rapid recovery in, in the dielectric, basically what can happen is that you can actually break this arc before you would hit a natural current zero, and that's that's what referred to as a current chop in this case. And so as we'll, we'll see later on, this is going to result in high overvoltages. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be associated with a fault. I mean, the case we were looking at before was associated with a fault with the transit recovery voltage, kind of the chop add-on in that case. But a lot of times this happens when we have regular types of load switching, especially when you factor in the fact a lot of load is connected up to the system by transformers. And let's suppose you have a light load or no load condition where you're switching transformers on and off. Uh, basically that looks like you're switching a large reactance in and out. And when you have that much um, inductance, that coupled with the current chop can lead to some high transit over voltages. And so there's uh, a case that was shown in uh, an IEEE paper. I just want to to talk a little bit before we go into the theory. And this what this led to transformer failure. Uh, this was this paper was written by David Shipp, who's uh, you know pretty well known in the industrial power area. And so what he shows in his paper and presentation is he's showing the insulation of a dry type transformer. And so what you see is you see the windings around the core. And what he's pointing out in this figure is there's, there's burn marks on this. And if you look a little bit more closely, what you could see is between adjacent coils uh, where you would have insulation painted on these coils, what you see if you take a closer look is there's actually some flashover. So basically these coils are next to each other. And then what happened because of this chopping action, then you actually had high values of DVDT. And what that did is cause a failure, kind of a localized failure in the insulation. And so you, you see these, uh, this evidence of, of the insulation actually failing in certain places. Uh, what he talks about in this paper is he talks about this current chop phenomena where this is something we're seeing now with these vacuum circuit breakers. And so basically, you know, what happens is you have these contacts opening in a vacuum. And what happens is you have this plasma arc that exists between the contacts as this starts to open. Um, what happens in this case is you get the metal vaporizing because the temperatures are so high. But uh, since you have this operating in a vacuum then, it's, it's, it's possible that you can get this vaporization to cease uh, before the current actually hits a natural zero, and then what you um, would get is you would get this chopping action. And so he, he talks about in this paper where this, for load switching, what these chopping levels could be is in like, like say like the three to five ampere region, maybe higher, just depending on the, the material and the circuit breaker, uh, what kind of voltage you're working at, what the system impedances are. But this little, this shows actually a field measurement where you're getting some current chop. You see the three phases for phases A, B, and C. And so what you see in this case is you see this interruption occurring first on phase A. The, the currents are 120 degrees apart. So one phase is going to hit, go to zero first. But what you see instead of waiting until natural current zero, that you see the, the current getting chopped at, at about the six amp level. All right. So he shows that this, this uh, phenomena could actually cause damage to transformers. So what we're going to talk about in this case is actually how we do this particular type of analysis. And this is sort of the thing you have to watch out for when you're switching the load, this load has inductance, and then you have stray capacitance associated with the component 
And then because of the fact you have an LC circuit and you have the chopping associated with the current, with this inductive current, you're going to get these high transit, what we call recovery style types of voltages. Um, if you exceed the breaker rating, you can get this breaker to failure. But then what they kind of get into this particular paper more is the fact that if you exceed the transformer basic insulation level, this is kind of the transit voltage rating uh, or the DVDT limits, then you can, you can actually damage the transformer. And for a dry type of transformer, this would be cumulative. So every time you switch, you get a little bit of damage, and you get a little bit more damage, and you get a little bit more damage, and until finally you, you you get just failure of the insulation. Um, so so anyway, this is this is something you would have to be concerned with in the field. And then in the paper, he talks a little bit about how to do the EMTP modeling for this. What would be the equivalent model? And so this shows where you have the, the load, which in this case is just simply the unloaded transformer. So a transformer would have inductance associated with it. It would also have some capacitance on the high side and also on the low side. It would just have a, if it was unloaded, it would just have maybe like a large shunt resistance associated with that that could be modeled. And what the source of the capacitance would be in this case is not only the capacitance associated with the transformer, but this is connected up to a utility source by a section of cable. And so, as we'll see later on, cable not only has series resistance and inductance, but cable also has a lot of shunt capacitance associated with it. So if we would use a pi type of model, we put half of this cable on the source side and half of this half of this capacitance on the source side and half of this capacitance on the load side. And so really what the LC interaction is going to be in this case is it's going to be between the magnetizing uh, inductance of the transformer and this net capacitance. Uh, so anyway, as far as mitigation, you will get into this a little bit later on this semester. You could put a surge arrestor there and what the surge arrestor would tend to do is it would tend to clamp those those over voltages. And there's combinations or you could use the surge arrestor with something else like a what we call a surge capacitor or an RC snubber which is kind of similar. Um, basically what we're going to try to we would try to do is we would try to reduce that voltage tab. But that's a that's a topic for later on. So anyway the way this particular lecture will be broken down is I'll, I'll cover the theory first and then I'll go through kind of an extensive worked example, and then I'll show you a PSCAD simulation that, that matches up this example. And I'll just put that in three different videos. So as far as this phenomenon, this would hold true for any type of inductive type of load, but the most common inductive load that you'd want to analyze is the situation where you have a transformer. And what the transformer would have under a no-load condition is if you think about the model, basically this is going to be dominated by the magnetizing um, inductance or reactance. Uh, this particular inductive value is given by L sub M in this case. So if you had, for example, a transformer at no load and you connect a voltage up to it, it's still going to draw some current. The majority of that current is associated with setting up the magnetic field associated with the transformer. And so that's what's referred to as uh, the magnetizing current. It's, if you take the voltage divided by that current, that's going to let that's going to give you a way of getting that magnetizing inductance L sub M. There's going to be a little bit of resistive component associated with that, but that inductance is actually going to dominate. And then if we had a case where, say, we didn't have a cable, then there would just be some natural capacitance between the windings. Anytime I have two adjacent windings, I'll have inner winding capacitance associated with that. And so this is a, the case we'll, we'll start off by looking at. And what we're looking at is when I open up the switch, what happens if I chop some current that was initially going through that induct uh, magnetizing reactance of the transformer? So one way we can actually analyze this without even getting into the differential equations, note in this case that we have a circuit that once this circuit breaker opens, there's no source, right? So you think, well, if there's no source, what's the source of the transit? 
Well, the source of the transit in this case is the trapped energy in that inductor. And so in this case, we have energy in that inductance that's associated with one half LM um, I naught squared, where I naught is going to be the chop current. And so basically, we've got this stored amount of energy. And when that inductor gets isolated from the supply, well, where's that, where's that energy going to go? Well, if you don't have any resistance in the circuit, basically what's going to happen, that energy is going to bounce back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor. And so basically what you're going to see is this energy gets converted from a magnetic field into an electric field associated with the capacitor and the trapped charge on it. And then after a period of time, the capacitor pushes that back to the inductor again, and the circuit just simply oscillates back and forth. Um, so even if this current small, this value of L sub M for the transformer is really huge. I mean, this, again, this transformer, if it's under a no-load situation, basically looks like a really huge inductor. And so we're, we're switching that on and off. We're, we're chopping current, and this, this energy's got to go somewhere. And so it's going to transfer to the capacitor, and then basically we're going to see an oscillation that's going to have a natural frequency, 1 over the square root of L times C. So when the chopping occurs, there's actually a little bit of current that's going through the capacitor, but that is going to be assumed that's going to be negligible in this case. Usually this um, magnetizing inductance is really, really big, and this capacitance is really, really small. So anyway, if we equate the energy stored up in the capacitor, then we have actually um, a really quick way of figuring out what that peak voltage could be if we assume that this energy that's stored in the inductor when the chop occurs all gets transferred over to the capacitance. So basically 1 half C V squared is equal to 1 half L um, I naught squared. And if we solve for the peak voltage, we get an expression where this peak voltage is the square root of Lm over C times I naught. This term, the square root of L over C, just occurs quite often. We've seen this before, where this is referred to as a characteristic impedance. Sometimes this is referred to as Z sub C. Sometimes this might refer to as Z sub naught. Uh, we characterize cables with this surge impedance, but basically this is going to give us some indication of what the magnitude of this peak could be. And in real life, we're going to have some resistance and some damping in there. But this is a pretty good indicator that, you know, based on the level of the chop current and how much, what's the ratio of inductance capacitance and the square root of that actually is going to give us some indication of what's going to be the peak voltage stress. So, as an example, how this, this formula could be applied, let's suppose we had a transformer. Let's suppose it's unloaded. Uh, it's one MVA, 13.8 kV, three-phase transformer. And let's suppose it's drawing 1.5 amps RMS. Uh, when the, the circuit breaker operates, and it basically chops this particular current right here. Um, if we wanted to get this value of L sub M associated with the magnetizing inductance, what we would do is we would just simply take the ratio of, of voltage to current. I mean, we still have to divide through by omega because V with respect to I is actually omega L. So if we solve, use this to solve for L sub M, if we have a 13,800 um, volt unit, we divide by a square root of 3 if we assume this is going to be Y connected. And then when we substitute in for this chopped level of current, what we would what we would see, I'm sorry, this is not the chopped current in this case. This is actually what it draws. Um, so so anyway, this is, this is what we're drawing right here. Um, and then this would actually give us the 14 Henry's. And then if we go ahead and assume that this is also what's chopped, so you know, this is, is this is this is actually the the RMS value it draws plus the chop value in this simple example. Um, then, if we had an equivalent capacitance of 5,000 picofarads, 
then if you take the square root of L over C, you know, that's 14 over 5,000 times 10 to the minus 12th. And if you assume also that 1.5 amperes is what we chop, it's also the magnetizing current, or we'll say we're going to chop all the magnetizing current, then what the potential peak would be would be 112 kV. And so in real life, not all this energy is transferable. I mean, there's going to be other components in here. There's going to be some resistance and other contact resistance as well to consider. But assuming that we had ideal energy storage devices, and this kind of shows the potential, it's kind of interesting um, that basically you can go from 13,000 over the, divided by square root of 3 times the square root of 2 when you convert that over to, inst to an instantaneous value. But you compare that to going all the way up to 112 kV. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of difference in this case. So there's a lot of potential overvolts associated with these current chops. So if we want to look at the more general case, let's suppose now we look at the differential equation solution. Let's suppose we add a little bit of resistance. What would this be? If this were an unloaded transformer, this would be um, core loss. Um, maybe we have some high value of impedance on the secondary side, we transfer over to the primary side. So, um, in any event, it, it kind of looks like a resistive load on the circuit. And so what's going to happen is, yeah, this energy is going to bounce back and forth between the inductor and capacitor. But then in the meantime, this resistance is going to dissipate energy in terms of heat and eventually uh, damp out this entire transit. So depending on that value of R, maybe this damps out pretty quick or it takes more time, but this would be the general case. So what we do in this case is we write a Kirchhoff current law going out of this particular node. Basically the sum of the currents going down is the sum up equal to zero. So you're going to have C D B D T, the voltage divided by resistance. You'll have 1 over L times the integral, the inductor or the bus voltage, um, plus the initial value of current is all equal to zero. There's no source on this circuit. So we don't have to worry about a steady state value. The steady state value just is zero. And so the, the transit value is the total solution in this case. We take the derivative of both sides of this relationship right here. We go ahead and we divide through by C. And then this is going to give us a second derivative of voltage plus 1 over RC times dV dt plus 1 over LC times V is equal to zero. And the solution for this, we're going to have a characteristic equation of the form S squared plus BS plus C equal to zero. And if we solve for the two roots associated with this, this is going to have the form of a voltage is equal to C1e to the S1t plus C2e to the S2t, which could have just real roots or could have complex roots. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and you know initially assume that it has imaginary roots, but depending on the value of the resistance, they could actually be real. But we can solve for S1 and S2 solving the quadratic equation. In the case where we have real roots, then let's suppose alpha is a damping term, omega is the oscillating term. Note that this is about equal to omega naught, but it's going to be detuned a little bit because of the resistance in the circuit. And then this is going to have the form of a voltage that's e to the minus alpha t times a1 cosine omega 1t plus a2 sine omega 1t. Um, so anyway, this is going to be, in these types of situations, generally a pretty high frequency. Then what we need to do is we need to apply the initial conditions. And so what we're going to have in this circuit is if, if I have primarily an inductive load in this case, if this dominates, then basically what we're going to see that is a current going through this um, circuit breaker right here, it's going to be lagging the voltage by about 90 degrees, right? It, we, we're not modeling any source impedance in this case. If he has some source impedance, you would have to kind of factor that into the circuit. But let's suppose the source impedance is negligible. Then the current's going to be lagging the voltage by about 
by about nine degrees. And so what's what's going to be happening is if we didn't have any chop at, at all, this their circuit breaker would be operating at a current zero, which would correspond to about a voltage um, max or min. Um, and so that's what the initial capacitor voltage would roughly be. It would be kind of corresponding to either the peak of the source voltage or minus the peak of the source voltage. Because of the chop, there's going to be a little bit of difference in that peak voltage. But if you kind of think about um, a source voltage, and you know we're basically having our switching around here, whether you have a little bit of chop or not doesn't really change that what that what that capacitor voltage is going to be by by that much. So it's roughly we're going to get about a peak voltage when the switching operation would be occurring. Um, so in this case, what we would have to figure out though is what's going to be going on with this change in voltage with respect to time. What's this dVdt type of value? And what's going to happen in this case is if you had some current going through this circuit breaker and that same amount of current was roughly going through this inductor, uh, assuming that um, this capacitance was pretty small and this resistance was pretty high, then what would happen as soon as this circuit breaker would operate is you would still have to have a Kirchhoff law condition holding here. And so if you had this amount of current going through the inductor that was given by I sub C, what happens as soon as that circuit breaker operates, that according to Kirchhoff's law, you have to have that same amount of current going upward. In other words, you have to have minus I sub C going down through that capacitor. And so what this means as far as an initial value right here for this capacitor, as soon as that breaker operates, um, what we're going to have in this case is IC0 is going to be equal to minus I0. This is a little bit different than we had in homework number two because the inductor and the capacitor were in series, where in this case the inductor and the capacitor are in parallel. So what we're going to have is we're going to have this minus this chop value of current is going to be C D B D T. All right. So the initial capacitor voltage is going to be pretty close to the, the, the peak of the source voltage. I mean, if we could do some um, pre-switching circuit analysis to get a more exact uh, value for that, and I'll do that in the in the example. But you know, as far as the DVDT value at time zero, um, basically we have to make use of the fact that C DVDT is going to equal to minus I zero. So the resistor voltage doesn't change anything. What can change instantaneously, though, is is the current going through the capacitor. Even though the voltage has to be held fixed, um, that current going through a capacitor can change instantaneously. So that's actually what gives in this case. Basically, that current switches from going through the circuit breaker to going through the capacitor. So then if we apply the initial conditions, then um, to our form of the solution, basically to this form of the solution, then what we're going to have is we're going to have V0 is equal to the initial capacitor voltage at the time of the, of the switching action uh, is equal to E0 where cosines evaluate at 0, sines evaluate at 0, and this is going to be equal to um, what we're going to see is A1 is going to be this initial capacitor voltage and then we have the derivative of the voltage with respect to time at time zero. This is minus I naught over C, where I naught is the chop current. Uh, we have to apply the chain rule in this case, as, as shown here. And what we could see is that minus I naught over C is minus alpha times A1 plus A2 times omega 1. So anyway, when you make this substitution, this is what you get for the final form. And so you see there is an exponential term which gives us the damping. So basically with time, this is basically going to force this voltage to zero. So this is the effect of the energy dissipation in the resistor.
there's going to be one term right here, which is going to correspond to the initial capacitor voltage. Um, this is going to basically be oscillating um, around around zero. And so this is one term we would have in here if we didn't have any chapping action at all. But then you have this other term, which is dependent on the chop and dependent on how much current was going through that resistor um, at time equals to zero. And the term that dominates is this term right here in conjunction with the, the sine omega 1t. If you take a look at this particular term, this 1 over omega 1c times minus i naught, basically if you were going to approximate omega 1 by 1 over the square root of Lc, what you see is this is basically the surge impedance times minus the chop current. So basically, if you do this calculation, uh, typically what you're going to see is this term right here is going to be a lot larger than this term. This is actually the term that dominates our solution and kind of gives us a pretty good idea about what's going to be the total voltage stress on the circuit right here. So we can kind of still see this when we, when we work through the, the solution to the differential equation. So anyway, uh, what I'll do in the next video is I've got a worked example. Um, what I've done in this case to make this a little bit more complicated is I've got a reactance in here, which may or may not correspond to a transform. I didn't really give you any indication what it, what it is in reality. But then we also have another inductance L1. And basically, this is a kind of significant source inductance. And so what we're going to do in this case is we're going to actually go through a little bit more work and see what the implications are as far as that initial capacitor voltage. And we'll see how much difference it would make. Uh, the other thing we'll then do is we'll assume that after we work this, that we add some resistance in the circuit, 10,000 ohm um, resistance in parallel with that reactance and see what difference that makes in the, the solution. And then we'll verify this with an EMTP type of analysis. And then what we're doing in this case is we're actually setting this simulation up where I can do a current chop. And what you see is a current going through the switch. And then when we get close to um, that value of current that it chops at, you know, what I typically like to do is blow that up just to ascertain this is actually happening. And this, when you guys are doing your, your PSCAD studies and you're showing me your waveforms, if there's a chopping action, you have to kind of show me something like this. Because if I were just looking at the total current, and it's a, initially this really large value, and if I'm trying to see whether you're chopping or not, unless you kind of zoom in on this, I can't always tell whether you have the chopping working or not. And it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference as far as where you're actually able to get the chopping action at because, as I said before, the amount of peak voltage you're going to get is related to the surge impedance times the current. So if you got this chopping off a little bit, let's say if you're actually chopping it too, well, you get more peak stress, right? So it's, it's very, your, your results are very, very sensitive to getting that chop value just right. Um, so anyway, as far as some references, I mean, you could maybe look at the section on reserve in Greenwood 5.2 where he talks about this. And there's some other references I've added on here too. Not only the, the thing, the, the phenomena I talked about from this paper at the very beginning, but then you'll see a lot of these vendors will have papers on chop current and, um, you know, what you would actually then seeing in the field. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and go through a worked example next.